Hey everybody, welcome back to Shelby on Safari. It is time now to talk about all things sea otter. I am so looking forward to this live stream. I've had a blast playing Animal Crossing and getting to meet a variety of different animals across the game. But today it's all about Pascal, the adorable sea otter that you meet while diving. Over the next few minutes or so, we will be going over four key things that I want to explore with you relating animals to pop culture, which is what I do on Shelby on Safari. So if you're new here, be sure to join the Safari because there's always something going on, whether it's Animal Crossing, Harry Potter, or just plain animal fact files. We cover it all on the channel. So the four things that we're going to go through, first off, how to find Pascal, because it does take some effort to find this crafty little sea otter. Then we're going to go over three weird facts about the real life Pascal, sea otters. Then in part three, we'll be going over yet again, three, that's the magic number today, it seems, <laughs> three cool otter studies, cool otter, cool sea otter studies, because I do like to dive in into the scientific world community. I am a wild animal biologist, so I had to throw in a few scientific studies. And then lastly, in part four, we will talk about scallops because that's the name of the game. When it comes to finding Pascal at Animal Crossing, it all comes down to the scallops. And we're gonna see maybe why exactly that is. So once again, friends, let me get Maui. No, I thought I heard Maui out the back. By the way, friends, I should say, you may notice some oddness behind me. Yes, that's right. This is the new and very, very uh, rough Shelby on Safari studio. I have a bit of everything. Really? He was in here and then he left. Hang on. I thought I heard him on the door. Come on then. We're live. Come on. Oh, he's a naughty boy. Come say hi. Ah, the magic of being live and live streaming. You get interrupted by cheeky boys. Did you want to say hi to everybody? This isn't the Maui stream. But it certainly will become one quite quick. Oh, hey, Alice. So you know just how mischievous Maui can be. I'll leave the door kind of open for you, Brown Face. So we are talking about Pascal. Let's literally dive right into it. So in part one, we're gonna talk about how to find Pascal. Now in this bit, Alice was actually quite helpful. Thanks, Alice. Because you need a wetsuit to go out and go swimming. Now I know some of you may be watching this are Animal Crossing pros, but I got Animal Crossing for Christmas. And so I've been learning the ropes as I've been going on and bringing you guys along with me, which has been fantastic in comparing animals to Animal Crossing, which has been a lot of fun. But alas, you do need a wetsuit to get swimming and get diving because there are plenty of things to explore under the sea. <laughs> I can't sing the song because I don't have the rights, but believe me, I want to. And so you have to get a wetsuit to go dive, to find Pascal. So diving is a bit fun. And in fact, I did a whole live stream on some of the sea creatures that you can find in January in Animal Crossing. I'll put the link to that in the description down below. That was a lot of fun to do. And as the seasons change, as they do in Animal Crossing, I'll probably be doing an updated live stream to talk about some of the new animals coming with the change of the seasons, at least here in the Northern Hemisphere. So you gotta find the scallop. So when you dive, you can get a few different things. You can get a pearl, which is always quite nice. Peter, Peter's now joined us. Did you wanna come say hi to you? So when you dive, you can get a pearl, you can get a variety of different sea creatures that all depend on the time of year, but sometimes you are lucky enough to dive and grab a scallop, which is really amazing that it can be found any time of day and any time of year. And that comes in handy when you want to find Pascal because often or not, Pascal will magically appear. <laughs> and so if he's just bobbing along in the sea and boom, when you find a scallop and you come up to breathe, he'll appear and swim right on over to you. It seems easy enough, but I've had trouble the past few days trying to get some screenshots for this live stream. It seems completely random. Um, again, it can be any time of day, any time of year. When you dive, just you gotta keep trying. You gotta keep going, keep diving, hold your breath, and <laughs> try to find a scallop. 
And that's what will bring Pascal over to you because he's quite keen to exchange. Now, at first, it might seem like he's just trying to hold you ransom and you have to have hand over the scallop, but you can reject him. But I highly recommend that you don't because once per day, you can exchange with him the scallop and get either a DIY recipe for like the mermaid set, which I highly, highly like and I'm trying to get. It's beautiful. I have a little dresser at the moment, but you can get a whole room decorated with these beautiful shells and all sorts of little assortments. So I definitely recommend exchanging the scallop over to him. So you could possibly get a DIY recipe as well as a pearl, which is often used in those DIY recipes or some mermaid outfit kit, which looks adorable. I haven't quite caught one yet, but I'm gonna keep diving and hopefully try to get Pascal to come on over and I can pass him the scallop because he also drops a nugget of wisdom as well. Sometimes he has some deep thoughts with Pascal, which is quite fun to read. So that was part one of how to find Pascal in Animal Crossing's New Horizon. All you gotta do is keep on diving, keep on diving and find that adorable sea otter. And that's the name of the game and the live stream tonight is talking about sea otters. So, <laughs> Ken, you might be a sea otter because you enjoy scallops as well, but spoilers for the end of the live stream when we'll find out what exactly is up with all these scallops. For scallops ahoy, I didn't know what better way to put it. I had to throw in ahoy there. Yeah, I'm a pirate. So we're going to talk over now three weird things about sea otters. They come across as quite cute. In fact, I have two here. I have my little adorable friend, oh, his little starfish came off, but super cuddly toy, but then you guys are in for a treat. Just to show you how much I love sea otters. I crocheted one. Now, I warn you, this was my very, like one of my very first projects for crocheting. Prepare your eyes. His face is a little scary, but he does have like a little clam. He had a blown a little clam. And it's like, it, the proportions are totally off, but yeah. Lots of sea otters stuff. I love my sea otters. So weird things about sea otters. I'll actually use him as a demonstration since alas, I don't have a real sea otter. Uh, but that would be cool, but not quite because they're quite tricky as we'll find out. So sea otters, they live in really cold places. They're along my neck of the woods back home in California up to Alaska. And they live in freezing temperatures. Well, at least for me, about 35 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, so super chilly. And most people would need a wetsuit <laughs> or maybe a two or three. But the sea otter doesn't actually have blubber, which is quite stark because you're like, wait, what? They live in that cold temperatures. How do they keep warm? Well, it all comes down to their fur, which is both a blessing and a curse, apparently. And <laughs> um, oh my gosh, <gasps> well, my brothers are here. I've been ignoring the comments. I'm sorry. Hi, everybody. Oh, how exciting. Ah, so as they probably know, sea otters don't have blubber, but they do have super thick fur. So I got some crazy numbers for you guys. To put it in perspective, just how thick their fur is. Humans on average have about 100,000 hairs in total on their head, right? 100,000. Sounds like quite a lot, right? I'm sure, you know, some of us may have more than others. I feel like I have really thick hair, which can be annoying since it's curly, but 100,000 ballpark estimate. Sea otters, these cute little adorable fuzzy creatures that don't have blubber, but live in really cold water. They have over 6,000 hairs per square inch. Over 600,000 per square inch. Yes, I'll let that sink in for you friends. That's a lot of hair. And in fact, that's a lot of grooming too. So when you see like imagery of sea otters or you get to watch a cool nature documentary, or if you're super lucky and get to be in California and be watching wild sea otters, you'd probably be like, whoa, they're grooming quite a lot. <laughs> but that comes in handy because as I said, they don't have blubber, so they need to keep that groomed and keep that really well maintained. So then that way they don't get hypothermia because if it gets matted, then the insulation is lost and then it's oof, no me gusta which I should also throw in just to have another fun number. Their body temperature is 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Ooh, that's quite toasty, um, but that must be nice seeing as they live in really cold water. Oh, it's Pip. It's Pip. Do you have a Pip, Alice? Who is Pip? Why is Pip? Um, yeah, is this a Pip? I don't know what his name is. I really should give him a name. If you have a suggestion, 
please leave that in the comments of what you think his name should be because I really don't like having stuffed animals that don't have names. I don't know why. Anyways, so <laughs> we're going through some weird facts about sea otters because we are comparing, 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 there we go, comparing the magical Pascal from Animal Crossing's New Horizon and seeing what can we find from the real world equivalent sea otters to give us a little bit of hint as to what really Pascal is all about. Why does he really love scallops? So we've just gone over just how insane their fur is because they don't have blubber. And so they live in quite cold temperatures. So they need that thick, really thick fur to keep warm, essentially. Um, I should mention on a sad note, though, to bring in conservation, that the sea otter, it's because of this fur that they were pretty much almost hunted to the brink of extinction in both the 18th and 19th centuries. In fact, they were hunted so severely that there is no wild sea otter population in Oregon at all along that coastline. So they're quite fragmented. There's quite a few in Alaska. There's still some in California, but kind of dotted along that Pacific, hello, northwest coastline. So quite sad. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, you would have to. <laughs> you would go through plenty of trimmers there for sure to get that sea otter a haircut. Although I wonder, I wonder what color their skin is under. Anyways, that's a thought for another time. So odd fact number two about sea otters. Now, diving. The irony about talking about sea otters and diving and animal crossing, because that's how you find Pascal. You have to dive down into the water to try to find a scallop. And when you come on up, then that's when you can exchange with them. Oh, it's such a beautiful irony that we have to dive for both sea creatures and scallops to bring Pascal because sea otters are fantastic divers because they can dive up to 330 feet to look for food. So we know they don't have blubber, they live in cold water and they have thick fur. They have quite the metabolism. They need to eat a lot, but we'll get to that in a bit because I wanna talk more about diving because it's just so surreal. So their average dive can last about a minute. Pretty good, right? But sometimes they can last, their dives can last up to five minutes in length, which makes me think, actually, why are we the ones diving for the scallop? Pascal is certainly more capable because I don't know when you guys play and sometimes you go after like the crabs, like the snow crabs and stuff. You have to really press that button to chase down those crabs while holding your breath. And sometimes you have to come back up, take a breath, go back under. Pascal, oh, he could catch those crabs for sure. He wouldn't need to keep coming up for breath. But anyways, silly animal crossing. <laughs> uh, their lung capacity, here's another crazy fact for you guys about sea otters. Their lung capacity is two and a half times greater than that of similar kind of mammals their size that live on land. So uh, they are really adapted well for this aquatic life, for diving for their food, because they have to eat eat a lot. In fact, they need to eat about 25% of their body weight each day. That would be fantastic. That would be like Thanksgiving every day. Every day is Thanksgiving for sea otters. Um, so to put that in kind of more numerical sense, like a 40 pound sea otter, for example, would need to eat about 10 pounds of food a day. So that is a lot of diving. And luckily, they're quite good at it, as we'll see. So moving on to some more water themed oddities for kind of fact three, the weird facts of sea otters that we're going through. This is, of course, a animal comparison video. I do love doing pop culture comparison videos here on Shelby on Safari. So if you're new, I encourage you to join the Safari because there's always something crazy going on, whether it's Pokemon. I've been doing a lot of that lately because it's the 25th anniversary of Pokemon, which is amazing. And also, you know, just generic kind of animal videos. Vulture Awareness Day was one of my favorite ones to do to raise awareness of some beautiful animals. But this is all about the amazing sea otters because they're so cute, but also quite vicious, which we'll get to later. <laughs> so weird fact number three about the amazing sea otter is that they can live their entire life in the ocean. That sounds like a dream to me. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but not having to get on land, just spend my days in the sea. Oh, that would be most excellent. Now, speaking of the water, they are the only marine mammal that can catch fish with their mouth, or sorry, with their four paws and not their mouth. Right when I said it, I realized, oh darn it, that wasn't right. So let's try that again. They are the only marine mammal that will catch fish with its four paws and not its mouth. 
as we see here, demonstrated by who I assume is Pip. Oh, hi, scuba diver Derek. Oh, they are awesome indeed. I bet you've hopefully seen them in the wild. I, I did get to go surfing once um, near some sea otters. I kept my distance, but it was really cool, but also really cold. Because as we found, they do like really cold water, about 35 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. <gasps> no, thank you. Um, but yes, was this, was this Pip? We're gonna say it's Pip. Okay, we'll go with Pip. Although I feel bad because if you have a Pip Alice, then this guy's kind of taking its name. So we'll see. Um, <laughs> so we covered out some of the weird facts of them being marine mammal. One other one that I want to mention before we go into some really cool scientific studies about the sea otter that are recent as well, which is really cool to see actual kind of science being done, but I digress. They are the only marine mammal that can flip over boulders on the sea floor. So they are really, really good. And as we'll find out towards the end when we talk more about scallops, which apparently is one of Ken's favorite things to eat, is their hunting abilities. They're amazing adaptations for living and eating as much as they need to because to help kind of keep, you know, their metabolism going because it's so high. So I just find that crazy that they can just, you know, they have so many odd amazing things about them being incredible marine mammals that make them able to not only dive for crazy periods of time, but flip over boulders, catch fish and food with their forepaws. They got it together. So once again, friends, we are here looking at the animal known as Pascal in Animal Crossing's New Horizon, the adorable sea otter that will pop up while you're diving for sea creatures, and if you just happen to come across a scallop, which by the way, you can find both day and night, any time of year, which is rather convenient, once a day, you can exchange with him that scallop to get a few different key items, which I highly recommend because he's adorable and why would you say no to a cute sea otter? But there we are. <laughs> now we're gonna look into three cool sea otter studies that I wanted to share with you just because it, it's sometimes nice to take a step back and look at what's actually going on. So all of these are recently published within the last year, and I'll put the links to them in the description below so you can check them out later. But the first one is quite ironic because if you've checked out my previous video on the sea creatures that you can catch um, specifically in January in the Northern Hemisphere in Animal Crossings, we talked a few bits about the crabs. And there is one crab in particular that you can catch called the Dungeness Crab. Now, this one caught my eye because it is looking at the connection between sea otters and Dungeness crab. Both those names, you can find them in Animal Crossing. So I thought I'd share this connection with you. So in California, obviously, where sea otters are found, there's also Dungeness crabs fisheries, and that is quite the big industry. And so there was a concern that the Dungeness crab fishery industry could be negatively impacted, per se, by sea otters because sea otters like to eat Dungeness crabs. So it makes sense, you know, a bit of concern there, especially if sea otters, you know, are making their way, you know, recovering from populations. Like I mentioned earlier, they were hunted to the brink of extinction because of their beautiful thick fur back in the 18th and 19th centuries. So this study... Sometimes studies, they have, you know, limited data set. But this one looked at data going all the way back to 1980 to 2018. So they had a beautiful data set. We love hearing about data sets that are that big. Um, <laughs> I know that sounds really cheesy, but it's really important. So they found over the course of looking at this data, doing a variety of statistical analysis, that the southern sea otter population their growth, their population growth, and the expansion of their range because of the growth didn't actually have a negative effect on the California Dungeness crab fisheries, which is a good thing. That's good. Yay, they didn't impact it because obviously people want their money. And so, woohoo, it's not impacted. And once I dove in a little bit deeper, I found that they actually don't really eat that many crabs, to be honest. The, the studies said that they referred to a previous study where it said the sea otter typically only eats about 2% of their entire diet. About 2% of it is Dungeness crabs. So that could explain why. Um, but another suggestion why they didn't really impact the Dungeness crab population was because sea otters mostly forage. Like we know they can dive deep, right? 
but they mostly dive in depths of about 25 meters, where the Dungeness crabs can be found in depths of 250 meters. So that means like the Dungeness crabs, if you know they wanted to, they could hide away further away from the sea otter. So that's probably some of the reasoning why, but also like if I was diving and I saw like a clam and I was like, oh, the, cra the crab's over there, you know, I'd probably go for like the clam rather than go for the big crab who was running away and have to hold my breath longer. Like I do in Animal Crossing when I chase after the little shadow of <laughs> the crab, but you know, I'm not a sea otter. Although I wish I was one. Let me know what you think. Or would you want to be a sea otter? I'd like to know because I certainly would like to be one. Especially nowadays when we're protected. We're protected. I say it as if I am the sea otter. When sea otters are protected. Oh, nice to see you, Trail of the Wild Wild. You are almost, is it? Is it right? You're getting quite up there with subscribers, my friend, aren't you? Aren't you almost to a thousand? I believe you are. If you're in the audience and you haven't yet checked out Trail of the Wild Wild, I highly recommend because he has leopard geckos and they're adorable. But he also does some fantastic stuff out in the field. And I can't wait to see what like spring stuff you find when it starts getting warmer and stuff when you go out. Oh, Alice, you would not like to be a sea otter. Tell me why. I think they're lovely. Please tell me why you don't want to be a sea otter. So the next story or study, as I should say, because we're going over three studies that have been done on sea otters quite recently, just to share some cool science knowledge, as one does, is about reintroductions, because I should mention it's not as easy as it seems. And it was quite interesting reading up on this because, as I mentioned earlier, sea otters, because of their fur, were hunted to the brink. And this study was more, not really a study, but just kind of setting the scene for otter reintroductions, sea otter reintroductions in Oregon, because they were completely wiped out along the Oregon coastline. And they have actually tried doing relocations and um, reintroducing sea otters to Oregon. I believe one was in the 1970s and it didn't quite work out, um, but they're reevaluating kind of what happened. And so I thought briefly, ever so briefly, because it is quite an in-depth topic, just mention it's not as simple as one may hope or think of just, ah, let's release a bunch of sea otters back into the wild. Obviously, as you probably can guess, there's so many different facets to how many sea otters, you know, government guidelines, you know, businesses, the impact that it will have on the local um, activity of humans per se. And that's one of the things that this study did indeed look at. So they wanted to see, it was actually published this year, talk about recent studies, 2021, they, their primary goal was to look at how many otters technically could be reintroduced while looking at like the core habitat areas along the Oregon coastline. So they divided into north, central, and south, and then were very specific about the type of habitat they live. As probably a lot of you know, they're quite you know keen to be in the kelpie areas. They're very, very much a keystone species for those habitats that you know the kelp forests, which are really fun to swim in. But uh, I highly don't recommend it. <laughs> but I, I but I do kind of recommend it because I had a lot of fun. But anyways, so they specifically were keen to take into account a few different things. Like I mentioned, the human sea otter interactions that could happen, whether that be by recreational activities or boating, things like that. You they had to be super mindful and look at data, seeing okay, boats go this way, like some of the big. Um, big ships. They had to be mindful of possible disturbances that way. Uh, fisheries, again, fisheries are a key one. Dungeness crabs, I believe they looked at red urchin fisheries as well, and that's quite impacted because sea otters as well could have an impact on those. So there's so many different facets for this reintroduction. Um, oh yeah, and abalone as well. They looked at the abalone fisheries because, as, as one might believe, red sea urchin, abalone, sea otter, they all like the rocky reefs. So that could have an impact if sea otters were re reintroduced there. So there's a lot more for them to look into. But what I found exciting is that they're getting the ball rolling in looking at the population number, the ideal population number of sea otters that could, you know, healthily be maintained along the Oregon coastline. So that's good news because that would be really amazing to be able to do that. But again, it's a big, long process. So even though the process has started, it probably will be at least a couple more years and a lot more research done, especially looking at things like at the consequences 
um, of human disturbance on sea otter populations. That would be a fascinating study to look at. But I could keep going forever because <laughs> sea otters are so amazing. And there's a lot of really cool studies that have been done recently on sea otters. The third and final one that I want to talk about before we move on is stone handling. So it shouldn't come as a surprise, seeing as Pip, for lack of a better name, is holding a little starfish. And then my scary, scary one. I don't know if Harrison and Evan and you guys, if you saw my scary one earlier, but this is one of the first things I crocheted. Uh, it's holding a clam, but we can pretend it's a stone because stone handling is crazy. So it's exactly what it sounds like, handling stones. <laughs> but it's a lot more exciting than just handling stones. So this study looked to gather reports. Now, it was very antidotal. Like it wasn't, you know, observation based. It was kind of like by a story um, and, uh, you know, surveys and things like that. But they wanted to ask wild um, sea otter researchers, captive uh, sea otter researchers and keepers, they wanted to find out what's going on with otter populations as a whole. There are 13 species of otter found throughout the world. Sea otter is just one, but they really wanted to see is stone handling common across these 13 species or species of otter, or is it just in a few species of otter? What's the deal? And they found that not every otter is uh, handling stones, but there's a few different, you know, things why that could be, because some of them aren't as commonly kept in captivity. So that really limits, you know, the ability of humans to be able to observe the behavior, things like that. But for the most part, 10 out of the 13 so far have been, you know, recorded or observed by humans, whether that be captive or wild, to have stone handling capabilities, that stone handling behavior. So it could be as simple as juggling, for lack of a better word, they're not being at a circus, you know, juggling stones, but they are probably tossing them, you know, catching them, playing to not totally anthropomorphize, but anthropomorphize, playing with stones, um, tossing it around. In fact, a lot of them, when I was reading it, I did laugh a bit because I feel, because I did mention I'd love to be a sea otter, where they would throw and like drop the stone and then swim after it under the water. I don't know if you guys had those little pool toys, the little sticks that were filled with sand, or sometimes they had like holes on either end and they were cloth in the middle. Hopefully you guys know what I'm talking about. Or rings, diving for rings. Hello, anybody in the comments, please, please, please let me know. Did you ever do anything like that? I love diving for rings and then just bursting underwater trying to catch them before they hit the bottom of the pool. It was a really important and really serious game. Diving for rings and then just bursting underwater trying to catch them before they hit the bottom of the pool. It was a really important and really serious game. It's actually sisters i could play diving for rings for ages and uh yeah so please let me know if you do something similar diving for rings so going back to stone handling behavior because this is really what makes sea otters just so amazing is that they are the only species of otter currently known to use stones as tools so they almost use them they're like mini thors right thor and his hammer milnir that's like sea otters with their stones they almost make a stone sandwich. So they have a stone on their chest, they have one in their hand, and then they have their prey items, so usually like an invertebrate with a hard exoskeleton. Pop it in the middle as a sandwich filler, and then bash it <laughs> to open it up and then get to the juicy stuff or the meaty stuff for a better phrase. So that is crazy that they have it as a stone um, tool to get their food, to get their prey, to open up their prey, to eat it. I think that is just crazy amazing about sea otters. And they can crack open their prey using that stone kind of sandwich technique as fast as 45 blows in 15 seconds. So literally bringing it up above their head and smashing it down 45 times in 15 seconds. That is some incredible speed. Talk about speed. I hear I thought the cheetah was fast. But no, the sea otter certainly uh, can use its little stone hammer quite quickly. So I should say that um, that was just a quick recap of three 
really cool, at least in my opinion, studies that have recently been done on sea otters. There's plenty more out there. There's quite a few disease ones as well, which were quite interesting to see. But I had to bring about the stone handling, the reintroduction aspect, given their conservation status, as well as looking into the amazingness that is, you know, the Dungeness Crab Connection. <laughs> As we dive in Animal Crossing looking for sea creatures, sometimes we come across the Dungeness Crab or sometimes a scallop. And that is in fact what brings good old Pascal, the topic of the day, over to you in Animal Crossing's New Horizon to hopefully trade with him your scallop. So that is a wonderful transition into part four, the final part of this live stream. We are going to talk about scallops and the importance of scallops because I find it quite interesting that the Animal Crossing game designers decided to make it all about scallops to trade. And um, <laughs> you're very distracting with your sea otter comments. See, float on your back and eat seafood all day like seaweed. Oh my gosh. You did that on purpose. So friends, before we move into scallops, I would like to express my extreme anger over being lied to. I don't know if you are aware of this situation, but I was recently made aware of a very serious and heinous crime that has been committed against, I'm trying really hard not to laugh, the people of this world. I don't know why I'm trying not to laugh because it really is serious. I found out that crispy seaweed is not actually seaweed, at least here in the UK, it is crispy kale. Do you know how devastating it is? I'm still angry thinking about it. They advertise it as seaweed. Just say it's crispy kale. Like, I'd be cool with that. I'd be like, okay, I might not pay, what, £5.50 for it, but I'd at least like to know that's what I'm eating. And to be told I'm buying seaweed. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, anyways, yes. You did that on purpose. I know you did. Thanks. So scallops. As mentioned in the beginning, sea otters need to eat a lot. Why? They don't have blubber and they have a really high metabolism and they live in really cold water. So they got to keep eating. They have to, they have to eat pretty much about 25% of their body weight each day just to keep going. So scallops are, play quite, quite a role in that, I would say. Among many other things, sea otters eat clams, they eat mussels, they eat urchins, dungeness crabs, snails, octopus, and you guessed it, scallops. So <laughs> I thought we would go a little bit more into the diving aspect of sea otters because there's a few things that you may have heard about of sea otters. Like if they find something uh, when they're diving, they can slip it under their loose armpit skin to bring it up. Yeah, isn't that crazy? If you haven't heard of it, you've heard of it now. That sounds like so cool to be able to have like a little bit of storage to like put like a clam in there, I guess. Save it. <laughs> Let me know, kid, if uh, if you do that too. Um, but yes, they do. They eat a variety of different things. I, I'm imagining they get whatever they can find because a study did say that the sea otter is a successful for getting food about 85% of their time. That was really high. I was really surprised by that. And maybe it's because they can dive for so long that maybe if they don't find it like straight away, they can kind of keep looking because we saw they can hold their breath, you know, for up to five minutes and they can go quite deep. So maybe that's why they're quite successful. Who knows? But that's what I think that, yeah, because I was like, woo, 85%, that's a really good success rate. So part of the reason why they might actually be able to have such a high success rate is their whiskers. Their whiskers are super sensitive and they are used to kind of locate prey. But then, as we mentioned earlier, with them being the only marine mammal that can kind of flip boulders, kind of using their forepaws as well to kind of flip it over or use their forepaws to grab food, they can use their little forepaws to dig for clams with their forepaws dig under the sand, grab them, stuff it in their armpit, <laughs> their little purse, and then uh, come back up to smash it with their stone hammer. How crazy is that? Oh my gosh. Yeah, leftovers in their armpits. Yeah, save it for later. If that, see, this is why sea otters are so cool. Not only do they look cute, but they do have a little bit of a vicious side and a little hidden side, quite literally, with their little hidden armpit. 
fit, but um, you know, there, there are so many different stories of sea otters. As some of you may know, there's the imagery of them hanging out in what are called rafts. They like to, you know, hold hands. They are typically, if you do see a raft, it is a group of a same sex kind of individual. So all females or all males together, but they can live in rafts of up to hundreds of individuals, which is quite cool. I find that's probably one of the biggest kind of social groups of the 13 species of otter. I believe most of them are about like 10 to 20 individuals. Some are even solitary. So that's pretty impressive for groups of sea otters to be doing that. Again, also we mentioned the kelp forest and how they are a keystone species within that. Sometimes they tie kelp kind of around them. They wrap themselves around in kelp. So then that way they don't drift away. There are so many wonderful things about sea otters. And we just briefly scratched the surface looking into the amazing world of sea otters, but then also comparing it to Pascal from Animal Crossing. And so maybe that's why, you know, he's looking for some extra little grub because he's a bit hungry because he needs to eat a bit more. So when you dive and you find a scallop, he's more than happy to come and take it off your hands and give you a pearl or a DIY recipe, which is really kind. Although I kind of wish he would go like for the crabs or something, you know, a bit more substantial. I feel bad just handing him over a scallop, but Hey ho, that's what it is. Oh, well, I hope you guys have a great <laughs> rest of the night. No worries, Harrison and Evan. I'm just about to wrap up because I hear Maui out there crying. It has been a fun evening going through the world of sea otters with you guys today, ever so briefly, and mentioning Pascal. Later on this week, I will give you a quick spoiler as to Friday's episode because, well, there's a certain TV show that is coming out really soon that I'm really excited for. And uh, well, I haven't done a superhero animal comparison video for some time since December with Wonder Woman and the Jaguars. So yes, let me know which superhero you think I will be talking about on Friday. But it's gonna be a bit different because I'm not gonna be comparing to just one species like I have in the past. I'm gonna be recruiting your help in the Avenger Initiative to decide which of the three species I present to you, you think the blank is most like. Oh, I almost said it, but I didn't. And that's what's important. Before I go, I just want to say thank you guys so much for hanging out with me, Maui, and occasionally some other cat named Peter that hung out, and Pip, as we looked at Pascal and sea otters. Again, if you're new here, be sure to join the safari by clicking subscribe, so that way you don't miss any animal pop culture comparison videos that are coming up in the future, like the one that's coming out on Friday. I tend to upload on Fridays. Occasionally, I do a live stream. I do have one coming up next Tuesday at 8 o'clock and I'll be having a very special guest with me and so I hope to see you there. In the meantime, have a great rest of the week guys and I will see you around. Adios! Oh, thank you Derek. Glad to hear it. Hopefully I'll see you around. Bye guys!